My name's Carmel Tebbett and I'm the CEO of the Mental Health Coordinating Council. Welcome to the third webinar in our Allies and Advocates series. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on. For me, that's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, but it will be different depending on where you're zooming in from. And I want to pay my respects to Elders past, present and future. I also want to acknowledge the contribution of people with the lived experience of mental health conditions and all that you have done for mental health reform in Australia. MHCC is the peak body for community managed mental health organisations. We started this series of webinars last year to increase understanding about the broader service system, including agencies and programs that interface with mental health community based services. So today's webinar is about the New South Wales Government Initiative Towards Zero Suicides. The government has committed to reducing the suicide rate by 20% by 2023 and released the Strategic Framework for Suicide Prevention in 2018. It provides significant investment over three years and today we're going to hear about those suicide prevention initiatives. We have three excellent speakers who I'm going to introduce in a minute. We'll hear from the speakers and then there'll be time for questions at the end. And I would ask that you put your questions in the chat function uh, and I'll be able to come to those at the end of the presentation. This webinar will discuss topics that some participants may find confronting. So please do what you need to do to stay safe. And if at any time during or after the webinar you feel affected, please seek support as appropriate. And of course, Lifeline is available at 13 11 14. I'm now going to introduce our three speakers. We're very fortunate to have three experts with us today from the ministry, a local health district, and also a community organization. The speakers are going to follow each other. So I will introduce all three now. Our first speaker will be Deb Hoban, who is a senior policy officer with the Towards Zero Suicides Initiative team at the Ministry of Health. Deb has worked in clinical, academic management and policy roles in mental health for over 25 years and in her words, is still learning and aren't we all? Deb will be followed by Ella Fife, who is the Suicide Prevention Services Manager for Wellways Murrumbidgee. Ella has a background in equine assisted psychotherapy and working with adolescents in out of home care. And Ella is passionate about breaking down mental health stigma in regional and rural areas. Our final speaker will be Sarah Reynolds, who is the acting towards zero suicide coordinator for the Southeastern Sydney LHD. And Sarah is a clinical psychologist with a background of working in community mental health. So thanks everyone for joining us today. It's going to be a fascinating hour. Thank you to all our speakers. Don't forget to add your questions to the chat box as the presentation is uh, underway. And I'm now going to hand over to Deb and I'll see you in a little while. Hello, everybody. I am just attempting to share my screen, but it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Deb, I think uh, Carrie will be able to sort that out. So we'll just give her a minute or two. Sorry, everyone, for this slight technical hitch. After all this time in Zoom, we still have to uh, get these things happening in the correct order. <laughs> I'll disappear again. All right, can everyone see my screen? All right. 
Sorry about that. <laughs> Always a technical hitch, isn't there? All right. So thanks, Carmel, for the introductions and thanks everyone for having us here today. Uh, so I'll get the ball rolling by giving some background to our suicide prevention work here in New South Wales. Um, as we know, people, families, friends and communities across New South Wales are devastated by the impact of suicide. It affects us all. And I will talk through some data to start with, but I wish to acknowledge that each number does represent a person and their family, friends and community. So... All right, I'm just having difficulty now moving my slides along, or is that? Let's try. Great. Uh, so back in 2017, um, just to think about the background to the suicide prevention work, an estimated 16 um, lives were lost each week. So that was a total of 880 people. More than 3,500 people were hospitalised due to intentional self-harm. And important to note to the, um, the prevalence for younger people and also for men over 85 years of age. So this situation amid the broader context um, internationally and nationally and an environment for action um, had been building for some time and led to um, some great work in the development of the strategic framework for suicide prevention in New South Wales. So as um, Carmel said, the work, our work is guided by the framework and we are working towards the Premier's priority to reduce the New South Wales suicide rate by 20% by 2023. So the New South Wales government has invested 87 million to, um, in a suite of initiatives known as the Towards Zero Suicides. Um, and with those, that suite, there's 15 of them, which we will go through today and describe for you. Um, suicide is a very complex issue, uh, and it's important to understand and prioritise groups at greater risk. Preventing suicides requires a very coordinated approach um, involving many different elements. So local communities, the private sector, and also government. Um, so in, it was really important that a careful design of those range of activities, those 15 activities um, could work together to then work towards preventing suicides occurring in our communities. Those 15 initiatives are organised or focused in four different areas. Uh, so trying to look at those different elements of the community in different areas of impact. Uh, so there's New South Wales Mental Health Services, um, New South Wales Government Agencies, the non-government sector, and also based in communities. So I'll start with describing the um, New South Wales Mental Health Service Initiatives. So Zero Suicides in Care is actually a, an initiative that happens within um, the, the health system and within the health service. So it's looking at change management and quality improvement, both in inpatient and also in community um, mental health services, community-based services. So there is training happening statewide for, um, for health employees under safe side and recovery-oriented prevention um, methods of suicide prevention, also a range of other training in skills-based um, training to support people um, through suicidality. Uh, we're also developing suicide prevention care referral pathways in each of the different districts and networks, and also looking at a, um, a large piece on looking at a much more just and restorative culture within health services. The second initiative is the alternatives to emergency departments. And you may have heard these described as safe havens, which is the, the name that we're providing to them within New South Wales. It has been applied in, in other areas as well. So we will be, um, there'll be 20, up to 20 safe havens across New South Wales in all of the districts and um, all of the districts and one network. Um, and they're for people 
who are experiencing suicidal distress and wanting an alternative to, to emergency department or looking and or looking for um, that for receiving a compassionate response from peer workers. So they're a non-clinical service and um, Sarah will actually be talking a lot more about this particular service model within South East Sydney. Um, but it allows people to, to go to a, a comfortable place where they, that they can um, feel accepted and respected have that access to peer workers and also have access to mental health clinicians um, as is needed and wanted. Uh, they're currently operational in three districts in New South Wales, so Cogra, Gosford and Port Macquarie, and the remaining safe havens will be opening um, over the next coming months. The suicide prevention outreach teams are also a proactive care model. Um, so it's a peer worker and a clinician working as a team, going out to people who are maybe in suicidal distress in the places where they live. So in their homes, um, schools, you know, whatever is appropriate. Um, so currently we have spot teams operational in districts, including South East Sydney, South West Sydney, Hunter, New England, Far West and Mid North Coast. And again, they'll be rolling out over the, across the, the whole state. Enhancement to Rural Counselling provides an additional 15 um, full-time counselling positions across nine local health districts in those rural and regional areas um, for people experiencing hardship in rural and remote areas with a focus and the, the clinicians have a focus on suicide prevention. The next focus area is the New South Wales government agencies. Um, and there's two um, initiatives that are happening within that space. One is the training systems outside mental health. So we've looked at New South Wales mental health services and improving capacity there. And now it's all the other services that we provide that people interact with and often interact with when they're in distress. So it's suicide prevention training for um, government and non-government staff who are in those public facing services so that they can provide a compassionate response to people in distress. Um, but also um, part of the training is that they actually can build their own personal resilience, um, which is an important element of, of being in a lot of those jobs. So for example, it's agencies such as Legal Aid, Department of Communities and Justice, Treasury, Fire and Rescue. Um, there will be 80 trainers um, trained across those government agencies, and we're aiming to have 20,000 staff trained over the two years. Um, so a very large piece of work, but something that could have you know, enormous impact. Um, also, there's a um, bespoke um, or tailored um, training process happening with Service New South Wales. So 3,000 Service New South Wales staff will be trained as well. We also um, have developed the New South Wales Suicide um, Register, um, which is a great improvement in the data that we're collecting. That's a partnership with the Ministry, the Department of Communities and Justice, uh, the State Coroner, and also New South Wales Police. Um, and so that will improve our capacity to understand what's happening in the state and then therefore respond. In the non-government sector, um, and I guess there'd be a lot of people listening today who um, are maybe providing these services, um, so welcome. Um, there's three that I'd like to talk to um, today that are part of the 15 initiatives. The first one is aftercare. So uh, Ella, who is following me in this presentation, is pro um, providing the aftercare service within Murrumbidgee, and she'll also talk more about that, so you'll get a chance to have a deep dive. But just briefly, um, so these are support services provided to people after discharge from hospital following a suicide attempt. Um, the provision is around follow-up, um, psychosocial support, and non-clinical support in the community, usually for a period of three months, but it can be extended um, if that's necessary. This is based on, so these services, uh, it's a um, bilateral agreement between New South Wales Health and the Commonwealth to fund these. Um, they, uh, the PHN is commissioned or commissions um, a service provider, which is a community agency, and they use the Wayback Support um, Service model, which is a Beyond Blue program for aftercare. So that's happening across um, nine PHNs in New South Wales. And so it en enhances the, uh, significantly enhances the aftercare provision in New South Wales, um, eight of which are currently functional um, and operating and one, one very shortly to open in Broken Hill. 
The youth aftercare trial is actually looking at um, a, really trialing a youth aftercare model that's going to provide very intensive, community-based, developmentally appropriate and assertive outreach service for young people following a suicide attempt. There's two trial sites for that and they are Western Sydney and Mid-North Coast. And the post-suicide support is the, um, the new services to support individuals and families who are bereaved um, or impacted by a suicide. Um, so it includes the family members and friends, but also is um, looking at first responders or members of the public who may have witnessed or discovered a death by suicide. Um, this service is being led by um, or provided by a consortia that's being led by Standby, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, they were contracted in November 2020 and the, the post-suicide support services offered um, or funded by New South Wales Health will be in Northern Sydney, LHD, South Eastern Sydney, Sydney, Western Sydney, Nepean Blue Mountains, Southwestern Sydney, Illawarra Shoalhaven and Southern New South Wales. So they're starting iteratively over the next few months um, and we expect that they'll all be up by July this year. Um, the rest of the state is actually going to be covered by Commonwealth funded services. Um, yeah, and I um, can't speak to when that will all be happening, but if you contact Standby on the 1300 number that they have, um, they'll be able to put you in touch with um, the services that are available. And the last focus area is within the community. And there's a number of um, initiatives that are based um, or are, are, I guess fueled by the community needs and also based within communities and have that community focus. Uh, so the local um, supporting local community collaboratives, this initiative will establish new collaboratives. We know that there are some um, great collaboratives exist existing currently and facilitate that very comprehensive, compassionate and localised response to suicide and to provide support um, for existing collaboratives as well. So Headspace has been contracted with Lifeline in January of this year, and the first four collaboratives are um, planned to commence quite soon. So they are in Maitland, Kayama, Northern Sydney, and in Varel. Can't quite see that. So um, the second, I think, is the suicide risk um, alert system. So this is um, just currently in um, planning at the moment, actually, to trial a suicide alert system in local communities where collaboratives exist. So stay tuned on that and we'll be learning more with regard to that. The building resilience in Aboriginal communities is a, a really exciting initiative um, where 12 Aboriginal community controlled health organisations will be implementing culturally appropriate suicide prevention activities relevant you know to their local context and the and the local issues so by aboriginal people for Ab aboriginal people expanding um, peer support and peer led programs um, so this initiative is trying to expand the number of, of peer led programs within the, in new south wales um, currently we um, we're focused on three uh, three programs being expanded they are from the eclipse program um, run by Lifeline, the Alternatives to Suicide groups that are run by Inside Out, and there's up to 10 locations in New South Wales that will be um, running those um, going forward. And also um, being uh, delivering a pilot of a new peer support group for um, people with a mental illness or mental distress that also have um, are experiencing suicidal crisis and distress. The gatekeeper training is um, 13 organisations across the state uh, delivering training in suicide awareness to local community members. Um, and it's about providing skills to the members of the community who might encounter people who might be, who will be encountering suicidal distress. So the, the point of the training is really to allow them to respond, to support, and then to refer on. And the last is the community response packages for priority groups. So these are currently um, under tender. The tender was um, released on the 8th of March and closed at the end of that month. So that process of procurement is still happening, but they're essentially, um, there'll be, uh, the intention is to fund five statewide packages, one for each of a particular priority group being um, men, young people, older people, LGBTIQ communities and Aboriginal communities. 
So that is the 15 initiatives under those four focus groups. I thought I would just bring your attention through the circles to um, the initiatives that are services that you can actually, you know, refer people to or inform people about so that they can then go on and access those. Um, the others are about that broader building the capacity and the quality within, you know, the system um, to enable a, a community that can respond um, together and appropriately and, um, you know, with a, a big impact to reduce that number. All right, so that's um, me. I'd like to hand over now to Ella um, from Wellways in Murrumbidgee. Thank you, Deb. I will just try and get my screen sharing. All right. Can everybody see that? Excellent. All right. So thank you for having me here today. Um, I'm going to be speaking for the next 10, 15 minutes about the Wayback Support Service. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people. So they're the traditional custodians of the land in which I'm based today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So before I begin, now I've got to figure out how to use the arrows. There you go. All right, so before I get too stuck into the way back, I just want to give you a little bit of context about the region in which we're based. So we cover a geographical area of over 125,000 square kilometres with an estimated resident population of 242,000. And you can see from the map that there are really big travel times between some of our towns. Um, most of the Murrumbidgee Local Health District is considered inner regional and outer regional, and we actually have one remote area. So what is suicide prevention aftercare? So Deb touched on this briefly before, but essentially we know that a previous suicide attempt is a really strong predictor of further suicidal behaviour. So suicide prevention aftercare is about providing access to high quality follow up um, and support after someone's attempted suicide or experienced a suicidal crisis. Um, and this aftercare has actually been found to reduce the rate of suicidal behaviour. So um, you can see that people discharged from hospital following a suicide attempt, 50% failed to attend follow up treatment. 38% of those who attend follow-up treatment terminate treatment within three months, and 15 to 25% of those who have attempted suicide may re-attempt, with 5 to 10% unfortunately dying by suicide. And the highest period of risk has been identified as the three months following a suicide attempt or crisis. So as part of the Towards Zero Suicides initiative, as Deb mentioned, Commonwealth funding is now going to be matched to expand Beyond Blues the Way Back Support Service. So not only is it going to be maintained in the current areas, so for us that's the Murrumbidgee, but also expanded into other areas um, in coordination with primary health networks. So the Wayback Support Service is a trauma-informed psychosocial support service that's designed to support the um, needs of people following a suicide attempt or crisis. So as a non-clinical service, we actually view clinical and psychosocial support as complementary rather than alternate approaches. Mm. We started service delivery of the way back um, in the Murrumbidgee in February 2018. And so far we've supported over 450 people. So the key objectives of the service are to improve access to quality aftercare to support people in staying safe, build the capacity of individuals to manage distress and improve wellbeing, develop links with community-based and clinical services to meet individual needs, as well as increase social connectedness and links to other supportive networks. So this might be peers or carers, friends and families. The way back is based on four guiding principles. So the first one is that support must be empowering. So the way back aims to offer strength-based support that empowers clients to seek, connect and maintain positive connections. Um, it aims to build resilience and ultimately reduce um, suicide risk. 
So the second principle is that psychosocial and therapeutic needs are viewed as complementary. So we view them as um, integrated. So they support one another. And while the psychosocial provides that practical on the ground support, we also help people um, stay engaged with clinical services. So we really recognise the need and the importance of people linking in with those services. Um, the third guiding principle is that support must be responsive to individual needs. So the way back recognises that each individual who may have attempted suicide or has experienced a suicidal crisis has a unique set of circumstances that have actually led them to that point. So we need to support an individual in, uh, following a suicide attempt um, to identify the needs, triggers, motivations, and we also need to work with people to identify their strengths and build on those. So the fourth guiding principle is that timely support is critical to managing risk. So the Wayback recognises that suicide risk um, or escalation of a suicidal crisis can be unpredictable. So it's really important that we provide people with timely support uh, when they're most vulnerable. So referral pathways um, to the way back. So our referrals primarily come from our local health district mental health teams. So for us in the Murrumbidgee, that's our mental health emergency consultation service or what we call MEX. And they're actually based up at uh, Wagga Base Hospital. Um, also, other hospital staff can refer to us. So that might be social workers, mental health nurses, um, peer workers as well. Um, and our other referral pathway is community mental health. Um, the eligibility criteria for the way back. So there are two different types. So the first is our primary eligibility criteria. So that's when a person has presented to um, one of our mental health teams following a suicide attempt. Whereas the secondary eligibility criteria, a person has presented to one of the local health district mental health teams following a suicidal crisis. So the secondary criteria, people may not necessarily have attempted suicide, but they may have had intent or plan to end their life. When we first started rolling out the way back in the Murrumbidgee, um, we would only accept uh, referrals for primary criteria, um, but quickly we really recognised the need to um, open up the service to secondary criteria. Um, all right. So what does it look like for someone to actually access support? So we'll receive a referral um, to the service provider. So in this case, Wellways. Um, this is reviewed by the Wayback team leader and we confirm eligibility. If someone isn't eligible for the service, we will notify the referrer and where possible, we'll suggest an alternative referral pathway. If someone is eligible for the service, we inform the referrer, we get in touch with the client within 24 hours and we arrange a face-to-face -face meeting where possible. So here in the Murrumbidgee, we also monitor our referral inbox seven days a week. So this means that we can touch base with people on a weekend as well. Um, so we touch base with people, we check in on their safety and we let them know that a support coordinator will be in touch on Monday. At initial contact, we generally obtain their consent to participate in the program as well as consent to contact a, uh, to contact a nominated health professional. So when consent is given, we open what we call an episode and a file for the person and we commence support. Um, we'll also send a letter to the nominated health professional and let them know that their client's involved with our service. So initial support will generally involve safety planning, um, completing a series of outcome measures. So here in the Rome BG, we do our um, K10, we do um, our World Health Organization Five Wellbeing Index and the Suicide Ideation Attribute Scale. Um, we also conduct a needs assessment in collaboration with the client and this helps us establish a support plan for this person. Outcome and needs assessments are actually reviewed again halfway through support and at the end of support, um, as well as safety planning. However, conversations around safety happen less formally throughout the whole of the support process. Um, our needs assessments and our support plans, they help guide our support coordinators in what support an individual will receive. 
Um, so in most cases, support coordinators will do a mixture of phone support and face-to-face -face support, depending on the client's preference. Um, and also it can sometimes depend on travel times. Um, the support time is three months. As Deb mentioned, um, it can sometimes be extended. But what we really aim to do is we aim to facilitate referrals to other services within that three month period. Um, so those referrals, they may be to other mental health services, but they can also be um, informal referrals to build a community linkages that might be sporting groups, community groups and things like that as well. So recently, um, here in the Murray Beachy, we've also received the contract for the peer enhancement trial, which is meant the integration of peer workers into the way that support service model. So we commenced service delivery for peer enhancement trial on the 17th of August, which now means that anyone who accesses the way back can also access peer support. Um, so far, the uptake for uh, the peer support has been really positive and over 80 participants um, since August and the family members have um, opted to have peer support as well as support from a support coordinator. So like the way back, engagement with um, a peer worker is voluntary and people can choose how much they wish to engage with a peer worker. Um, and you can see that 61 people have accessed peer care companion support and about 23 have accessed peer family support. So there are actually two roles which I just mentioned. So one is the peer care companion and so that's someone with a lived experience of suicide and their position to share their experience of recovery with participants as well as the strategies they use for their well-being. We also um, have a peer family support worker now. So this is someone with a lived experience of supporting a loved one through a suicide crisis or attempt. And they're also positioned to share their experiences of supporting a loved one, um, as well as how they looked after their own well-being uh, in the process. And the title peer care companion, so um, they're based off care values of compassion, awareness, respect, respect and empathy. So that's how they came up with that title. Prior to implementing the peer enhancement trial, we went through a design process. Um, so we held co-design workshops uh, in April last year. Yeah, in April last year. Um, and this informed service implementation in the Murray BG. And so these workshops actually included individuals with a lived experience of suicide, uh, Roses in the Ocean, Beyond Blue, and Well Waves. And we originally hoped to hold these in person, but um, because of COVID-19, we had to move them to Zoom. So once we received the information from these co-design workshops, this was then integrated into the Wayback service delivery model. Um, and this service delivery model is being constantly reviewed throughout the 12 months as we learn from this process. Part of um, one of the outcomes from this co-design workshop was that we needed to implement an internal referral form. Um, so this helps us to monitor peer worker caseloads as well, so that we don't overburden people with too many um, too many people to support and it can also help us to monitor travel times as well um, as well as help us to make sure that we're getting the right fit for peer worker and program participant. We also developed flyers so that was something that was identified as necessary um, so that this means that when someone starts with the way back they're now given this information and even if they choose to not engage with peer support to begin with they can choose to opt um, into peer support later on if they identify that um, as a need. Another thing was that our, uh, um, our support coordinators and our peer workers really needed to work together, um, but also have different roles. So you can see that support coordinators are more focused on completing intake and review paperwork, um, facilitate outbound referrals, complete safety planning, liaise with clinical service and attend review meetings with participants and other supports, while our peer workers focus more on um, reviewing and implementing safety plans, they share lived experience and build hope for our participants, they act as a role model and mentor, 
help with skill building, advocate for the system needs, attend review meetings, um, and also our key family support focuses primarily on family members and other loved ones who identify their need support. So our programs are always being evaluated um, and we're always monitoring for quality. So part of what we do is we give participants a client experience survey at the end of support and this provides an option for people to feedback to us um, what they found helpful and what maybe they didn't find so helpful. Um, we also review our outcome measures as well, um, the ones I mentioned previously. Um, and we also make sure that our participants are aware of our online complaints and compliments register. Um, another thing that's happening this year and next year um, is that NAUS Consulting, which is an external program evaluator, will be doing an evaluation of the way back across a range of different sites. So in the Murrumbidgee, they'll be completing a deep dive by conducting interviews with program participants, um, some of our staff, as well as holding focus groups. So they aim to find out what's working for the way back, how change occurs, um, and how we can look at improving the model. So this is something that we're really looking forward to over the next 12 to 18 months um, to continue to grow and build our service delivery here in the Murrumbidgee. So that's probably about it for me. So I'm going to now hand over to Sarah, who's going to speak to you a bit about the safe havens. Thanks, Ella. I'll just get my slides up one moment. Okay, so hoping that's given enough time for my slides to pop up. Um, so my name is Sarah and as mentioned earlier, I'm from South East Sydney Local Health District and I'm really, really excited today to be able to talk about um, the alternative to the emergency department or the Safe Haven program, um, which as Deb mentioned, is just one of the many initiatives um, that have been funded through the Ministry of Health. So the main focus of the alternatives to the emergency department is to be able to redirect people to appropriate and immediate support um, when they're in times of distress or suicidal crisis that isn't the emergency department. So we know at the moment, often when people are feeling suicidal or in crisis, the emergency department is the first place um, they may go to. Unfortunately, the nature of the emergency department means that it's not always the most appropriate place for someone to go. So um, in funding these initiatives, it was looking at how can we set up an alternative uh, safe space for people in crisis to go to um, that will provide them with more targeted support. Um, and again, similar to the way back model, um, the care within these emergencies to alter, alternatives to emergency departments um, is provided by both peer workers and mental health clinicians. There were some key elements that we were given in setting up um, this program. The number one was this idea of co-design or co-production. So this was this is the concept of really working with people um, with lived experience of suicide or suicidal crisis, either personally or through bereavement, to develop a service that would meet their needs. So we went through an extensive co-design process in my local health district and met with many, many um, local community groups to get their input. And that's how we ended up at the model that we've got today. Um, it was really important that the space was close to the emergency department and accessible so that it is a viable alternative. Um, and it's a drop-in centre. It's not a place where um, people can stay overnight. Um, and in particular, looking to be looking for it to be open at times when all the other services are closed, so evenings and weekends. Um, a few other really key components of this program is the idea of a no wrong door approach. So. Um, and I'll speak more to that soon, but there, you know, there's no referral required. Um, it's no kind of eligibility assessment. Um, it's a non-clinical service. Um, our only sort of 
limitation around it is that um, our guests need to be above 16 years. But even if someone comes who's below that age, then our staff would work with them to link them in with a more appropriate service. So we'd never send anyone away from the safe haven. Um, and then a few other um, components having sort of some clear risk management policies in place, um, being recovery oriented, linking people in with appropriate services. And of course, like any service, being able to evaluate it and show it will work. So in our co-design, these were the key values that came out um, from our many, many discussions and sort of what we tried to encapsulate um, when we're setting up the safe haven. So the number um, one thing was that it was person-centred. So the person is at the centre of the service and that's who we're here to serve, who we're here to support. This idea is risk tolerant and I think um, this is a concept that is relatively new I think in in some sectors so that idea of being able to sit with some level of risk and not quickly escalating to emergency department as soon as someone may mention thoughts of suicide or self-harm so sort of being able to sit with the person unpack what they're going through and then work out if they do need to be escalated or maybe they just need someone to listen to non-judgmental welcoming respectful and human connection and I guess that's particularly important um, with COVID last year there was a real sort of sense of people feeling isolated even more so than they already did so we really wanted Safe Haven to be a place um, that would build a community where people could come to for support. So this is taken straight from our brochure um, as to what happens at Safe Haven. So when someone arrives at Safe Haven, we have a dedicated peer worker who acts as the host. So they'll greet that person, welcome them to the space, give them a bit of a tour if they want to, or if they're in distress, they'll just sit down with them and help them to calm down. Um, and then the, the guest has their choice of what they'd like to do. So they can either chat with other guests or with uh, peer work, uh, the peer workers, They there's a tea coffee station with some snacks and things like that we've got an activity room um, we also have a low sensory room um, if people sort of don't want so much noise around because the activity room can get quite loud there's ping pong and board games and a playstation and all sorts of that um, and there's also lots of information about other services in the area because I guess a key focus for this is to help improve people's connection and then link them up with supports that they might need again there's no kind of straight format really what people want is is what we're trying to offer and a critical part is that there's no referral no appointment required so here's just some pictures of our safe haven to give you a bit of an idea of what the space looks like so we our safe haven is set up about 500 meters from our emergency department um, and it's in an existing building which we also use as our recovery and well-being college during the day um, which provides a number of different courses on mental health and well-being that are co-delivered um, by both people with lived experience and clinical educators. So it made sense for us to co-locate Safe Haven with the Recovery College. And so up in the um, this corner here, you can see that's the main area where people first come in. Then there's the option to go into the activities room with the table tennis and there's Steve, one of our peer workers, demonstrating the PlayStation. Um, this down here is the sensory room and that's actually changed a bit since um, this picture was taken. We've now got a massage chair in there, which is very popular, um, as well as a number of sort of low stimulus sensory activities to help with people's emotion regulation skills. Um, and then we've got a library here, so we encourage people to sort of have a bit of a book exchange and things like that. So in terms of how um, Safe Haven, I just thought I'd talk you through some of the numbers and how things are going. So since we first opened, we had our soft launch on the 4th of January, we've had 140 guest uh, visitors. So that is some people who are coming back multiple times. And as it says there, of that 140, that's made up of 21 different people. Um, our guest visits have also been slowly increasing. So January, we only had eight, then 22 in February, March, we had 52. April, we were down a little bit, but we were closed on some days because our previous um, rules around our building meant we couldn't be open on public holidays. Um, but we've just started seeing the numbers in May and I think they're already up to about 30 or something. So I think we're gonna get back up to that sort of 50 number, if not more. Um, in terms of age range, so a fairly even spread across the years. Um, we're looking, I guess, at how we can reach out and capture some of the people in the 65 years plus age group, because um, we know that's a really vulnerable population, particularly when it comes to suicide risk. Um, 
And then gender breakdown, we can see it's predominantly females who are accessing the service at the moment. So I guess our plan for May is we've identified a whole range of um, support services, men's shared, men's line, um, other associations in our district and organisations to connect with them to really get the word out there and try and capture men. Because as Deb was saying before, we know this is, um, men is a really vulnerable group in terms of suicide prevention. Cultural identity. So. Um, for any of those who may or may not know South East Sydney, we have quite a diverse um, population here. We cover everything from um, the Bondi Beach eastern suburbs down along the coast into the Sutherland Shire. Um, our safe haven is based at St George, which is why I guess the majority of guests have come from that area. But we've also had a few guests coming in from other parts of the district um, and also some people who are coming from outside of our district. So that's exciting. As Deb said, there will eventually be a safe haven in every LHD. Um, but at the moment, this is sort of the breakdown. And even when there are other safe havens, we're not going to turn anyone away because of um, where they live. Um, okay. And so this is just a basic um, SUD scale. So we get people to rate the level of distress when they come in um, using this sort of chart here from zero to 10. And then again, when they're leaving, so we can sort of track how the safe haven um, is going to impact. And I get this graph here is sort of demonstrates um, all the visitors, I think, from March um, and where they sat on this SUD scale. I guess one thing we did note was that there were a few people who were becoming quite anxious when they were leaving Safe Haven. Um, and that was part of, I guess, um, whether they were going back home or, you know, anxiety about other stresses that they may have had in their lives. And so um, our staff have found the SUDS a really good tool to sort of work with people that if there are regular guests that we know get distressed when it's coming time to leave, they have a bit of a plan in place or they work with that person to think about, okay, what do we need to do? How can we start preparing you to go home so that you're in a good place for when you leave? Um, but the majority of our guests are, you know, coming in with sort of a moderate level of anxiety, uncomfortable, but can still sort of go about their business. So I guess that says, you know, they're not people who would need to go to the emergency department. Um, and then generally by the time they're leaving, that anxiety has dropped down significantly. This is also a new um, question that we just brought in last month, because I guess we're really wanting to track how much safe haven is diverting people from the emergency department and other support services. Um, so I've just said to people, as it says there, if Safe Haven wasn't open today, what other services or supports would you have gone to? What's really interesting is there's this huge group of people here who say that they wouldn't have reached out for support. So um, that's, I, I guess, quite um, comforting maybe is the word, I'm not sure, but good to see that people who previously may have stayed at home um, might have been isolated and things are actually finding the safe haven um, is a place to come. One thing I didn't mention earlier on um, with our safe haven is that guests can remain anonymous. They don't need, they're not registered in EMR. Um, it's really just like a drop-in centre. Um, so I thought it would be good to just present a guest story and give a, a bit of an idea about how safe haven is benefiting some people. So this particular guest um, has become a, very regular guests at Safe Haven um, and often attend when they're feeling suicidal um, and needing that support or someone to talk to. Um, this guest has spoken about having these chronic feelings of suicidality and in the past having presented to their ED quite frequently where they felt very invalidated in the sense that they would often just have a mental health assessment and then will be discharged home without any further support. Um, so this particular guest has now embedded Safe Haven into their crisis support plan. And when feeling distressed, if Safe Haven's open, they will come to Safe Haven first rather than going to the emergency department um, or calling a acute care team. Um, and so we actually, with this guest permission, had a look at their data. So we can, we looked at the last three months of last year versus the first three months of this year once Safe Haven opened. And we can see that before Safe Haven was open, they presented to ED 25 times. Um, and none of those presentations resulted in an admission. Um, and you can see they spent almost 60 hours in ED. Um, then since Safe Haven launched, they were first introduced to the service in January. Um, the number of presentations to ED dropped down to 16. So almost half of that. Again, the amount of time spent in ED was down to 28 hours. So again, almost halved um, and no further admissions. And 
when this data came from, I guess looking at the first three months, you can see the guest had, was slowly tracking up. Um, the blue line is their visits to Safe Haven. And if I was to pull the data again now, you'd really see a distinct difference in those two. So I should do that for my next presentation. Um, and then just some last before we wrap up for questions, just some feedback that we've had from our guests here that I'll um, lead you to read for yourselves. But I guess what we're really finding with Safe Haven is it's a very valued service. Um, it's We're doing something different that we haven't done in health before with this idea of risk tolerant, not having um, to sort of collect data through EMR, allowing people to remain anonymous. And that's being really well received by the community. And um, it's really good for the staff as well in terms of they, you know, um, because there's been that co-design process, it's feeling like it's really meeting a need. And a lot of them speak about their previous experience um, and how important a service like Safe Haven is for individuals who are feeling isolated or lonely or in crisis. Okay, um, so there are our website and things, these slides will get circulated so um, you can all have a look at them if you like, but I will hand back now um, for our panel questions. Thank you. Well, um, hello everyone and thank you to all our presenters. That was uh, just amazing. Uh, really, I think uh, a great um, diverse uh, representation of what's happening, being able to hear from the ministry, being able to hear what's happening on the ground in a regional area, and then Sarah's presentation about the safe havens and what's happening at the LHD level. And as you can see from the chat room, the feedback is really um, fantastic. So I'm trying to keep an eye on the chat room and collate uh, the various questions. I think one of the questions that seems to be coming up quite a bit is how people can find out about the rollout of safe havens in other local health districts. So Deb, I might just throw to you on that if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, so probably the best way is through connecting with your um, local mental health services and um, all mental health services have a partnerships coordinator that I would guess for a lot of community organisations you would be in touch with. So that would be certainly one way. Um, I noticed Sarah has um, information up on the website for South East Sydney that would also be um, true of them. But if you really get stuck, feel free to email me as well and I can help you get in touch. Great. Thanks, Deb. And look, there's a number of uh, people who've asked if the slides can be circulated. And yes, all of the presenters have agreed to uh, share their slides. So MHCC will undertake to circulate the slides and um, the webinar will also be on our website. Uh, so you'll be able to access the recording there. So Sarah, one question that's come up is what are the hours for the safe haven? I think you might have touched on yeah. that. If you could just say that again. Um, so I saw a few comments about that. So it's actually very exciting because as I mentioned, the building we're using is underneath a residential apartment building. So initially we weren't allowed to open beyond 7 p.m. or on weekends or Sundays. We've just in the last fortnight um, had our approval received from council. So we can now open seven days a week. Um, so from the 1st of June, we'll be changing our hours to 4.30 to 10 p.m. seven days a week, 365 days a year. I'm on mute. That is exciting. That is exciting. Yeah, it's it's. We put the application in back in October, so it's yeah. very exciting. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. So, um, Ella, perhaps one of the questions that's come up is about the Wayback Support Service and how um, evaluations being built into the role. You talked a little bit about that in your presentation. Can you maybe touch on that a bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, Part of what we do is we, we continually monitor um, our outcome measures for all our participants. So we just look at those um, and check whether there's a significant reduction in some of the scores on those. Um, we also have our client experience surveys as well, um, which we give to all our participants of our programs. And then as part of that, we actually feed that back to the PHN um, in our quarterly reports, um, what the feedback from those experience surveys have been. Um, and then there's a more thorough evaluation that's just in progress at the moment done by an external evaluator. Um, so that sort of 
coming up. It's, it hasn't started. They've just been getting through ethics um, to start that whole process, but that's going to be a really in-depth evaluation of the Murrumbidgee site and a few other sites around Australia. Thanks. It's so important to have those uh, detailed evaluations so that we can really demonstrate um, how these programs are making a difference. I thought, Sarah, that slide that you shared um, with regards to that participant and um, the reduction in the amount of time they were spending in the emergency department was, yeah, really powerful. So there's a question here. Um, uh, I want to hear about Alt 2SU. I'm not sure if anyone can respond to that. No? Okay, we might have to follow up that uh, after the presentation. So there's another question about uh, how might the announcements in the Commonwealth budget enhance the uh, Towards Zero Suicide Initiatives in New South Wales? Now, I can't recall, I think Deb, but you mentioned that uh, one of the initiatives that is being rolled out funded by the New South Wales government is also going to be rolled out in other areas funded by the Commonwealth. Uh, are you best placed? I know the, the, the budget's only just been handed down, so a little bit early but yeah you may want to make some comments on that sure um so there were some really um heartening and um and great announcements within the budget around um aftercare and um some other initiatives as well and support for mental health so um so that's great um it's um I guess for, for New South Wales Health, we work really closely with the Commonwealth and are really trying to make sure we obviously have specific roles, um, but really want to make sure that we um, integrate um, the different works that we're doing um, and that work collaboratively and continue to try and fill those gaps. I mean, that's the biggest risk, I guess, with the different funding models, et cetera. But um, yeah, we're very hopeful that um, certainly um, we can continue to build, you know, the suicide prevention services and strengthen that and the budget um, does have some opportunities. Great, thanks, Deb. I'm just looking at the chat. Um, people are talking about the, um, are there any services planned for the Bega Valley area? I'm not sure if anyone's going to be able to respond to that. It's sort of a bit, yeah, Deb, Ken? Sure. So within, um, so Bega is, sits in Southern New South Wales LHD. Uh, so they, as per all LHDs, um, they have a, um, a, sorry, a, they will have a spot team and a, um, a safe haven. I'm just, I think they're just in the process of deciding where their safe haven will be. So I, I probably aren't going to be able to respond to you specifically. Um, but I know Bega has certainly been, um, the Bega Valley has been um, certainly on their agenda and talking about what they can provide there. So um, certainly get in touch and, um, and find out more. Great, thanks, Deb. And Sarah, there's a question here. Um, average length of stay of a visit by a guest to the safe haven? Are you able to? Yeah, um, look, I guess we're not tracking that um, to the minute, but what we've found is that a lot of guests come along and actually stay till it closes. So at the moment, as I mentioned before, because we had limitations um, and had to be closed by 6.30, most guests would stay until then and then head home. Um, particularly once they get to know each other and there's a bit, you know, there's sort of a community that's building up around Safe Haven, which is good. I also noticed someone asked about council approval. The reason we had that issue in our district was because our Safe Haven is in a non-health owned building. Great, thank you. And Ella, there's a question about how the Wayback Support Service is integrated into the community um, and particularly to reduce stigma and integration with culturally diverse communities. I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, I can. I mean, it's it's, it's a big question, um, but I'll touch on it briefly. So when we originally established the way back in our area, we actually set up reference groups um, and these were made up of both community members and stakeholders. So this actually um, helped us integrate the way back into our local communities. We don't run the reference groups anymore, but all our staff are involved in community groups and interagency meetings as well. So we have staff involved with our um, Walker and Region Suicide Prevention Network, um, Gundagai Dual Diagnosis Action Group, Multicultural Interagency Groups and things like that. So we're always trying to be involved um, as much as possible and get that feedback from community. We're also really lucky here that um, we also have a 
community engagement um, staff member who's focused on suicide prevention. So a big part of their role is delivering training, education and awareness to community members. So we often work quite collaboratively with them, get out to communities, um, get involved in events, hold events um, and go to people where they're at. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe one final question. Uh, someone's I'm interested in what insights into men's needs might have been found in the co-design process of the program. So I don't know if anyone can respond to that. You might be referring to the co-design that we held here. Um, there was nothing specific um, that I can recall that was discussed around men's needs. Um, I mean, this, we, we know that men are more likely to die by suicide. So this is certainly a target group for us. Um, and we do try and get involved in communities. So we, we're linked in with the Murrumbidgee Men's Group. Um, we do things for men's, I guess, Men's Health Week, um, that sort of thing. So from memory, there was nothing specific, um, but it, we are aware that um, we need to approach men and talk to men as much as possible. Um, and from uh, my LHG, again, nothing specific really came up. And I guess that's why we're now doing a co-design process specifically with the sort of leading um, male support services and things in the district and getting people in to figure out what it is we need to do. Because as you could see in the data, we're, we're not capturing men and we really need to. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Ella. Um, and look, thank you uh, to our three presenters. As I said, I thought that was a really fantastic session. There's a lot happening in this space. We know how important it is. We know the impact that suicide has in our community. Uh, I think to get the perspective from the three different areas of activity was really valuable. And that's certainly um, being uh, followed up in the chat room. I'm just reading one here. Thanks, all that was great. Very well received with glowing feedback on the speakers. So thank you, Ella. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Deb. Very much appreciated. Thank you uh, to all our participants for being with us today. Can I thank Corin Henderson, the Principal Policy Advisor at MHCC, who put today's webinar together. As I said, this is a series of webinars. We will continue to have them on a range of different issues. So keep an eye out uh, on the MHCC website. Sign up to our weekly newsletter, FYI, because in that way you'll uh, be kept informed about all of the things that MHCC is doing to support mental health in New South Wales. Um, and we will circulate the slides. The speakers have agreed that they're happy to do that. So we will circulate those slides. So thank you so much to our speakers and uh, have a good day, everyone. I'm going to leave you all now and uh, hopefully see you at our next webinar. Thank you.